we're top of the hour. This is when I promised you that the content would start. So the, what I just did wasn't content. I was just saying hi. So, hi, everyone. It's good to see you again. Um, so I will hand it off to you at 7 o'clock. You ready? You ready, Randy? You ready, Robert? Come on, you ready, guys. Henrick? Yes. Okay. I brought some Greg, technical up. backup, by the way. So oh, for the on. whole time? Look, yeah, I yeah. yeah. One thing I can do. <laughs> yes. I need to find out. Oh. All right. Yeah. Shoot. You brought technical backup? <laughs> it did. Where's my technical backup? Uh, that's, that's, that's your fault. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, yeah, the thing actually, the thing about the questions in the mic is no joke, because otherwise, when people are watching it later, they hear. And it's just kind of pointless. So, yeah, when you have your question, be sure to shout it out. Now, of course, I can't find my, there we go, my slides. All right. So what I'm going to do, um, we how many people saw the abstract and like actually looked at the abstract that was online? Yeah. All right. Great. A few hands coming. So the idea, the premise that we wanted to do tonight was with the advent of a lot of conversation in the community, various open infrastructure communities about, um, about containers and should containers run on bare metal? Should they run nested in VMs? What about projects like Kata containers where you try to run a stripped down VM and just have the bare essentials so you can spin it up faster and make pack profile smaller? What's real and what's not? And so Henrik and Randy and Greg agreed to sit down and just kind of debate this and throw some things out. The point of this format is not so much that the oracles, <coughs> the oracles we have here, uh, come down from the mountain with stone tablets, with a mix of metaphors. Um, but that that we have some disagreement and we have some argument because those arguments, those disagreements, that froth is where you really start to see, you start to highlight some differences in approaches because there's more than one way to solve the problem, right? So we put together those topics that you saw in the uh, in the abstract as just a guide. And uh, if you have your questions, just shout them out. What I want to do is let everybody introduce themselves. Henrik, we'll start with you. Cool. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Robert. My name is Henrik Rosendale. I, I run um, business development for, for New Vector. Um, New Vector is, the, the short version is it's a Kubernetes security platform. Um, it's 70% firewall and network-based security and 30% and um, looking into processes and files and doing vulnerability scanning and, and that sort of thing. You know, we're we're sort of here in the house of Juniper, and so there's some there's some some interesting um, you know overlaps with uh, with these technologies. Great. Yep. My name is Gary Duan. So I'm the co-founder and CTO. I also <coughs> run the engineering team in the right time. I'm Randy Bias. Oh, oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the problem is, is like any kind of good introduction takes too long. Um, well, let's not do that. For, uh, for those who don't know me, I was well known in the OpenStack space. I built one of the first startups that, that was an OpenStack startup. And then before that, I've got a long history of doing systems engineering, network backbone engineering, AS2828 is my baby, um, data center build outs, um, InfoSec solid for seven years, but also part time is the rest of my job for a lot of that time. Um, I grew up on SunOS 3.1 and SCO Xenix when I was 15 in 1986. And uh, I've been buried by the IT bug ever since, I guess. Santa Cruz operations. I was in Santa Cruz. My mom worked in Santa Cruz. Right. Oh, All right. All right. So um, what we'll do is we'll kick things off. We'll start with, uh, with the obvious topic area. Um, <laughs> not sure why we suddenly. It's a it's, it's a fireside chat. It, it is it is a dumpster fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure that's not right. the Please don't tell me. Okay, so most uh, most container infrastructures do run in some sort of nested VM environment. Google, I guess, still does that predominantly. Uh, but let's let's. Let's start there. It's it's this common assumption that nesting is a best practice for security. Um, is it? Is that the best way to go about it? What What do you got, Henrik? Let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're out there um, installing Kubernetes in you know you know at this point probably over a hundred uh, enterprises here in North America, and the and the most sort of common way of in, you know of running Kubernetes is really on um, um, EC2 if you're running in in, uh, in Amazon, you know very few larger enterprises have adopted the sort of the, the pre-baked frameworks. So 
we don't really see EKS. I mean, people are playing with it, but as a sort of a, a general means of deploying Kubernetes, we see you know classic sort of EC2 run your own VMs, and then you are free to pick up and move it to some place else if you so desire. So I would say that's that's like eighty percent of of the uh, of the of the uh, implementation. Gary, should it be eighty percent? Well, I, I think so, and think most of our customers are using virtual machines. I think the benefits not only the the security benefits, but also the operational. So you can clone, you can migrate, and if your virtual machines get compromised, uh, you can you know start over. So that's I think the major benefit. Yes. So um, when I first got exposed to containers, I was running something called FreeBSD jails. 2004-ish. That's about the time that uh, Google contributed back C groups, which really started uh, containers within Linux. Um, and for those of you who are around at that time, you probably know that FreeBSD jails did not run inside of VMs. Um, containers are, are commonly referred to as operating system virtualization, sometimes application virtualization, which is different fundamentally in the hardware virtualization. And as I think many people know, the concept of that of operating system virtualization has been around as long as mainframes, right? So it wasn't a new concept. And I think um, one of the services that Docker did for this world is it basically packaged up containers and made them easy to consume. And one of the disservices it did to this world <coughs> is it packaged up containers and made them easy to consume. <laughs> and the downside is that you know people said, oh. I've got a VM here, I need to make a container, I'll just take everything in this frickin' VM and stuff it inside this container. And the net result has been that um, something that I initially used in 2004 as a security mechanism is now actually you know, the source of a lot of security con consternation. And what I mean by that is, when I was using it, um, we were building this scale-out <coughs> cluster to do natural language processing search engine in this crazy startup that would Catch me over beer sometime. It was totally insane. But um, one of the things we did is we decided that we needed to um, basically take all the services that we were using. They were all based on ULISP. Don't ask me. Told you crazy story. And we needed to put them stripped down as only the application code plus its library dependencies, anything else it needed inside the FreeBSD jail. There's literally nothing in there. These are teeny. You know, they're like tens of megabytes in size. Right? The attack surface was tiny. And then we ran them as unprivileged users, right? And they didn't have access to do anything except send packets out to the network. They couldn't send it to another container, another jail in the same box. They couldn't send it to the host box, right? And we made sure that each one of those jails ran in its own file system that had only the permissions for that unprivileged user. So accessing that container over the network, exploiting it, you'd have to get through that incredibly small attack surface. And then once you were in there, you had no tool chain. You got no compiler, you got no scripting languages, you got nothing. So you'd have to bootstrap all of that. And then once you had that, you'd have to have, figure out how to escalate your privileges from the root. I mean, that is, those are very, very, very tall hurdles to, to go through if you know anything about security. So what happened, in, in my estimation, is that in many ways, Docker kind of ruined things because it became, it, containers became a packaging exercise for application developers. It just became an easy way for me to package up my application and shove it around, but there's not a lot of thought to it. I've seen containers that are gigabytes and gigabytes in size. It's just crazy, right? But I believe that if containers had been used in a proper way, that they actually would be much more secure than VMs. And in fact, my crazy idea at Cloud Scaling Days with Paul Guth over there was at one point I wanted to use containers to host KVM instances inside of the container to increase the security mm -hmm. of the KVM instance. <laughs> so um, I guess I'm just trying to say in a long-winded way that um, I think that it's just been done wrong. So I'm going to start passing this microphone down. Let's, what about uh, the project that Intel uh, Clear Containers Work with Hyper SH and created the Kata Containers project. Is that is that a better way to go? At let's start in the middle this time. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think well, in a way, it does increase the uh, benefit to the security because you you can you essentially run the uh, virtual machines, right? The Kata or the Clear <laughs> Container Initiative. Uh, essentially, it's a virtual machine, but. Uh, I, I would say people, when they using virtual machine and the container, not only they, they got benefit of scalability, manageability, also they talk about you know, the how to, uh, 
uh, oversubscribe your using your CPU and memory. And uh, well, I believe this technology has the benefit of the security that it introduces a lot of overhead. Uh, and it, in terms of managing, for example, if you say the diagram of how they can integrate with Kubernetes, there's a very complicated proxy and have to talk to the agent running inside the, the, this virtual machine. So that's introduced a lot of uh, overhead. And uh, I have seen some uh, statistics reports like uh, at least like 30% of uh, CPU or memory overhead introduced by the by this uh, container VM. So, so, so wait, you the 30% of the of that's from the VM <coughs> from the VM it's just from the VM. Just the VM. And that's like if you just if you're using KVM as the as just a full size hypervisor or well, on top of the hypervisor VM the, the container VM okay. introduced another 30%. Part two of my previous rant because I wanted to cut it off. <laughs> um, I guess it's just the security person in me. Like I, when I think about how things are secure, I don't think about you know the hand waving that some company like VMware does to tell me that something's secure. <coughs> what I think about is my own eyes and what I can see. And uh, hypervisors have some inherent problems, right? The, the most important problem is that the attack surface is huge. And, and people don't get that at first because what they think is, well, the lines of code for hypervisors is relatively small. This is very true. Um, however, if we look at the PV drivers, the para-virtualization drivers, which are required to get good performance, para-virtualization para drivers are millions of lines of code in the aggregate. They come from dozens and dozens of different vendors, Ubuntu, Red Hat, Microsoft, and so on. And they have to run with relatively privileged uh, capabilities on the back end at the host level where the hypervisor actually is. So if you're inside of a VM, it is possible, and the largest attack surface is to go through the PV drivers, right? And most of that code is, you know, not super well vetted, unlike the hypervisor code. So my crazy notion is that containers, which have little or no code, <coughs> have a much smaller attack surface than VMs, which have significant amounts of code in the form of the PV drivers that run inside them to get reasonable performance. And what people like to point to as a way uh, that uh, Hardware virtualization actually provides uh, some kind of security guarantees is by uh, this isolation notion, right? Because I've got a kernel in, uh, running inside the VM, because I kind of have my own virtualized hardware, I've got isolation between different instances. But if you agree with me and you think that the PV drivers themselves are a large attack surface, and millions of lines of code that are not well vetted, written by tons and tons of different vendors, then you've got to ask yourself, really, how secure are they? And there have been uh, a lot of uh, privilege escalation through the hypervisor, through the PV driver exploits in the past. I don't think I can add anything to this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well then. then Robert, go ahead. Let's, let's talk about just, your Just jump on it, man. Don't, don't wait for that. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, okay. One there, one here. So, when you point about the you know, power virtualization driver PV, Buggy. I also all code is buggy. My point yeah. is that the, 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 the number of lines of code inherently makes the attack surface much larger. Period. Yeah, I was gonna say namespaces are inherently buggy as well. Sure. But it's so much easier to go process to process, i.e. from container to container than it is to go from VM to VM. I can attack a container, I can get into the the host kind of one user at a time in a VM. Uh, I, I I think that's an open question. I think if it's if the container was configured properly, that that's not it's not as easy as you say it is. Also, I think that when you consider security, not only the system security, also the application itself. If you pack, I guess that's your point earlier. If you pack too many applications, like typically VM does, then you won't get more. You 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 get a zero day access to my Java application. Uh, well, let's let's make it let's make it even harder for you. Uh, my Go-based application, you've got a shell. Your user Bob, right? You've got no access to any toolchain. You've got no compiler. You've got no Perl. You've got no Ruby. You've got no Python. You've got no anything. The only libraries that are on there are libc and you know a couple other things. Okay, break out. This is this is the 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 nut of what I'm trying to convey. And, and, and the thing about what I'm trying to say is that if you think about it, 
all this stuff is very fixable, but people are lazy about how they put stuff in the, in the containers. They're extremely lazy about it. I just want to clarify about PV attack surface. Are you arguing that PV attack surface is larger than the host kernel, or just that it's larger than the way people think about it? It's much larger than the way people think about it. They are used to thinking about the hypervisors being relatively secure, and it is because it's, it's hundreds of thousands of lines of code instead of millions. And when we suddenly expand that dramatically, the attack surface grows, right? So I have a two-part question. So uh, Henrik mentioned that you see about what, so 70, 80% of people running containers inside of the app. Uh, but then you kind of, some almost like clarified by saying you see people running on EC2 instances. It's not like in Amazon, it's super easy to run in there now. So are you seeing it in the public cloud uh, running the VMs uh, because because that's what you do. Right, right. So <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you transport that onto on-premises, right, right, into private data centers, yeah. uh, does that statistics change in any way? I would say a very few customers that are implementing very large, <coughs> homogenous uh, infrastructures will run bare metal. eBay's but, running bare metal for all right. the Kubernetes deployments at the edge or whatever. Yeah. It's but, but if you have like a sprawl, an application sprawl, they end up in, in, in VMs and then they're running Kubernetes in VMs. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Data centers or whatever. Yeah, private, private cloud or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, on private. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the second question is maybe for you, Randy. Um, if you would have to start from scratch, would you go with bare metal or VMs? Metal. Metal. All the time. VMs have a lot of overhead that I don't think are necessary. And, um, you know, what I used to do when I was building my FreeBSD jails is I would run the app and I would use, like, strace to basically figure out all the code paths. All that stuff can be automated. I don't understand why we don't have tools that allow you to execute an application in a restricted environment like a VM, and then you watch what the application does, you model it, and then basically you build a container that's form fit to that. Instead, what we do is we lift and shift everything out of a VM into a container and pretend that like somehow that's a container. I just don't think that's a container. It's a lightweight VM. We're running inside of a big heavyweight VM. It, like we don't have a lot of advantages. And I think you mentioned that Google's running con uh, containers and, and hypervisors, and I'm almost certain that's not true. I don't know if there's anybody here who knows for sure, but my understanding was that Google didn't like to take any performance penalty, and they certainly didn't want to take a performance penalty for hypervisor. I think there are little or none in that. I, my information could be, but, well, my information is a year old, so they. they it's meant to be Google Cloud or Google. Not Google, Google Cloud. Google. Google, Google. Google, Google. Google. Yeah. Google. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's all metal. <laughs> so the people who, who did the primary, instigated the container thing way back in the day, <laughs> run it, have always. But that it. also fits the profile well. You can, you can sort of build tooling and security and management into an application stack if you control you know, top to bottom. Well, let's, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the tools. If, if bare metal, if, and it seems there's a consensus here, bare metal is the preferred way to do it. The, is the tooling mature? No. All right, let's talk about that. Well, so, so my, my point here is, is you know, we've, we've spent um, 15 years, you know, getting deep into the, into the world of, of VMware and the processes, and it, there are sort of established procedures from, from A to C. And if you have a, a sprawl of an application, uh, environment which most you know enterprises do then that's the that's the preferred method that's the you know that's what they're comfortable with in, in, and know how to do and so the yeah, tooling well, is I'm, gonna, I'm yeah. gonna jump in here on this Henry see the thing is is that containers are, are containers are mostly antithetical to, to sprawl because you have to use the same kernel uh, for the most part which means you know you're not running Windows containers on a right. Linux host so Actually, most of the people who are successful with containers are running relatively homogenous environments, and there's not really an application sprawl. Now, you could say, I've already got an application sprawl. I've already created my virtualized silos with VMware, and so I'm just going to keep using that stuff, which mm -hmm. people can. But then I don't think that you get all the benefits of containers that you possibly But then all of a sudden now you have an environment where you got a you know VMware environment for you know and a Kubernetes environment and they will they they will live side by side. Well, and so side why by not? side or one on top of the other? And, right, but but what we see most predominantly is then you know customers opt if it's an on-premise you know implementation to run the whole thing on VMs and then just you know pay for the performance penalty because at least they have the established processes down. Absolutely. The maturity, there's no doubt that the maturity of VMs versus the maturity of containers is, is day and night. 
Right. It removes some some variables, right? And they're willing to pay for it. Yeah, I was saying if they're experienced a team who can manage their cluster, they typically they tend to use uh, bare metal. We do see some users they have this very huge node with thousand one thousand five hundred to thousand of containers running on, on that bare metal. So that's certainly possible, but for other users, it's still more users as you were put using those machines. What about um, what about deployments where an organization has a VM-based private cloud running OpenStack and they want to use <coughs> Ironic within the same infrastructure to run their containers on bare metal? Is that is that a worthwhile approach? Ironic. <coughs> <laughs> if you like pain, <laughs> can you be more specific? <laughs> Ironic's a shitty bare metal provisioning system. <laughs> Is there a better one? Uh, I think we shit canned it, didn't we, Paul? We did. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe go see the rack end guys. Rob would love to hear from you. They use Maz for that. Maz? Okay, we're Maz. trying to do bare metal. We are going to store container native on bare metal with 10,000. The, the, the fundamental problem with bare metal provisioning, like it's if you're going to do metal, it's it's better for you to, um, in some ways, um, be responsible for the operating system itself as a as a as a team. Um, the problem with bare metal provisioning is that people are under the impression that x86 boxes and x86 boxes and x86 boxes and x86 box, and 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 it's not. It's there's it, no. We, we used to get hundreds and hundreds of people who are successful at doing bare metal have very large hardware management teams like Google and Amazon and so on. And bare metal is actually very, very hard. It revs very frequently. The chips rev very frequently. The firmware revs very frequently. The differences between IPMI and the different vendors is, you know, just nerve wracking. And, um, you know, it's just the, the in combinatorial support matrix that people see with any kind of software that you run on hardware like VMware's kind of support hardware compatibility list. That just gets blown out of out of proportion if you try to like build a bare metal provisioning system that can handle like say the last ten years of x eighty six boxes. It just it's it's really much too hard. So it's better um, if you can to pick a vendor, a bigger one like a Dell or God forbid HP, and um, <laughs> and to you know really standardize on a you know, very small number of configurations and one particular operating system. And if you're if you're really diligent about that, you can get it to where you can you know really kind of turn them out regularly. And uh, in that case, you can make it work really well. No, I agree. We do have standardized on two uh, Linux. OS. You're the Moss man. I'm the Moss man. For the homework. So we don't we don't really have a big diverse set of uh, hardware and software running different versions. Just uh, yes. But uh, what we do have is a very large build system. The build platform is so huge that every single user who needs two terabytes just to run his build. So we can do incremental builds on a container within an hour in the bare metal. It takes two hours to run on the VM. So the best way we have handled the whole layer is we have extracted what the user needs to run. So when you need to there. when you need to put on a new um, a new firmware a new BIOS on the motherboard and uh, you have to different. and you have to boot into no it's it's super relevant super important because you have to standardize your metal yeah so how do you guys do you have a mechanism for booting into DOS because all the firmware update software is in DOS and and pretty flashy the BIOS yeah so it doesn't all happen at once it's all rolling updates so we one of the key things that I learned when designing the system was. What we decided was we cannot have concurrent downtimes on multiple nodes. So we need a distributed file system uh, or something like we've been looking at companies like uh, you know NetApp for distributed solutions. But recently I've been looking more at Portworks that, that has a layer on top. I like them. Where's Lisa? So, yeah, he just went outside. Okay. Uh -huh. So, 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 you're, so you're a little bit more in the weeds than I want to do. I want to understand how you're solving the bare metal challenges. You so know, bare metal challenges. How do you how do you how do you in an automated fashion configure the BIOS for vendors that don't have any APIs to configure the BIOS? So in our case, that's not a problem because we have vendors who do have 
Well, you picked very specific yes. vendor yes. that yes. has some this capability. I didn't go on the rails and said, let's go open this new land out and build my own ASIC. That's not what we did. We found the right mix of hardware that would support, be supported. Yeah, on these other that's how you can make it work. Yeah. yeah. That's so right. the big challenge we do notice is in terms of security. So like, you know, container, when you said, like, you look at SSH and go to the container, uh, they may have, what are you going to say that? No, no, I wouldn't lend somebody SSH into a container. Okay. Man. They're cattle, yeah. dude. So if it stops responding, case, <laughs> Yeah, in our case, we do have to allow users to exec into containers. And then they can, if you avoid security around that, we restricted users not being able to assume or reboot or do anything that is malicious outside of their brand. All they can do is run their process and get out. That's it. Right. So there are third party utilities. I don't know if you guys are into Ishkia and looking at third party tools like sure. Osu and others. So we are implementing those uh, components as well. Okay. So I'm really interested in knowing how you would solve some of these problems in a bare metal world. Like, you know, I go back and resurrect the Sun Opterons with the service processors. That's what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like to see a container came out of Sun, so I, I kind of disagree with you on that. But uh, one of the things that I definitely would like to understand is how you would implement TLS or other network security into that mix. Um. I guess I've been avoiding the, the questions about network security to a degree because, I mean, those don't really fundamentally change that much with containers. Yeah, they changed with Docker's crazy networking thing that got, yeah, anyway, we don't need to talk about that. And But Kubernetes kind of unfudged that. You see how I sidestepped the uh, actual F-bomb? You didn't even notice that, Robert. No, I didn't. Unfudged, that's my new name. Unfudged. Unfudged. <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of it's the same, right? I mean, TCP IP is still TCP IP. <laughs> it doesn't change when you're running it in a container, right? Um, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not 100% sure what to say there. New Vector's got solutions for that. Juniper's got solutions for that. I'm not really here to talk about products. Um, I do think that one area that I think is still kind of under, under invested in is the notion of distributed security mechanisms, right? I mean, you see VMware, they're like, oh, VRMer, just slap like, you know, just slap a virtual firewall and plug it into the VM, right? And I just, you know, it's pretty old school, right? I mean, none of that stuff really scales very well. I'd like to see a lot more of kind of what EC2 security groups brought, you know, you know kind of more of that distributed firewall. I'd like to see people trying to solve a lot more of the problems about how we uh, get to deep packet inspection, layer seven, you know, with those distributed firewalls, that's a hard problem to solve, right? If you can solve those kinds of problems, you can make a lot of money. Um, and, um, and and probably more importantly than anything else, I think that um, a lot of the paradigms of security that we've had for so long are starting to break down. I mean, you know, I, I feel like a broken record because I have to say this every time I talk about security, but the Security is designed, the whole security industry, the security professionals, everything is designed around the gates and moats, walls. You know, you build this static security infrastructure and you're like, it's never going to change and people have to, you know, hop through my defense in depth to like fix everything. Except we live in a world now where everything's changing constantly. We're rebuilding, we're re releasing, we've got, you know, this, these 10 containers go away and the 100 spin up there. And in that kind of world, I really think that the security needs to move closer to the application. So harping again on why <coughs> we're doing containers wrong, I'd say if you start by having a set of tooling that allows you to strip containers down so they've got a minimal attack surface, if you do things like take some of the clear container technology, some of the hypervisor technology, and you start to build it around the container so that you've got a, a, a more dynamic, lightweight kind of suit of armor that follows the application wherever it goes, <coughs> like that's a better paradigm. And I just don't see people pursuing that because the way that a lot of the regulatory and compliance measures have been set up is like, I can say I did all the things on the checkbox, I checked all the boxes, and then when shit goes sideways, that's not my fault, I followed all the rules, right? And I, and I just think that that's really sort of a problem. And, um, and then the second part of that, and I'm sorry, I'm both writing the mic, um, is that, um, you know, I've seen, I'm seeing certain people go to the next level with security, like, 
and there's a company called Walarm that I'm disclosure I'm an advisor for, and they've taken uh, web application firewalls, which are basically useless, and they've added machine learning to the equation so that you are not just sticking some arbitrary set of rules in front of a web application and saying, you know, block all this stuff because I think it's bad. Instead, you're learning what the normal traffic is to the web application, you profile it, and then you basically, you know, block everything else. That kind of more kind of anomaly-based detection where you're leveraging machine learning and where you're bringing sort of that kind of technology closer to the application itself, that stuff's going to scale out. It's going to scale out really well. You're going to be able to leverage GPGPUs and other specialized kinds of chips to make it really fast. Um, and I just really think a lot of that stuff sort of underinvested in, underrepresented in, because what we're trying to take is take all the old security paradigms of firewalls and stuff, sorry, Henry, and, and jam them into container land, and I'm just not sure that that works other than this, as a stopgap measure. So I'm actually closing so, the mic. <laughs> so I, um, I fundamentally agree with you on the, on the latter part of, of, of this, where you know, security has to, to be much closer to the application, and that is um, possible. You know, in a in a in different way in a in a container environment. You did say something that I profoundly disagree with, which is it's still TCP/IP and it's still the same. <clears throat> the whole reason for for new vector existing is that it's not the same. You know, 30 years of 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 network and security policies have been based on IP addresses and ports and machines that you could point to and saying it's that guy. That's the dot ten dot nine, right? Are you going to make and, a pitch on intent based policy? Uh, and and now and now all of a sudden you have these ephemeral workloads that may exist for five minutes, may exist for five days, and by the time you get around to identifying a security breach, that thing is it's is still long, ports. It's still ports and IPs. Gone. It they they are, but they are. Um, they're very ephemeral and they're very fluid. And, that, that was my point. And, and none of the static sort of policies of the old world, pardon me, will, will con, you know, conform to this yeah, environment. Think, yeah, the network, network doesn't change and the, even the attack vectors, they don't change, but the way the problem, problem presents themselves actually change. Uh, you know, mostly distributed, very um, you know, short-lived you know, uh, workloads. Let's take one more question on this topic, and then we'll move on. There we go. Oh, I know you digress a little bit out of provisioning, but what I can't comprehend is where is the difference in provisioning bare metal, uh, hypervisor from bare metal, and provisioning VM on top of it, and provisioning containers in it, versus just provisioning an operating system on top of a bare metal. Wouldn't I have to basically use more tooling to set up hypervisors first, as opposed to less? Like, so I don't understand the premise of that what that was given in the beginning of this uh, uh, subject where a tooling is immature. Tooling the tool is the, the same. You just hit APIs and execute calls. You know? No, when I'm when I'm talking about the tooling, I'm talking about the tooling for building, creating, and maintaining containers. And I'm talking about the real foundational container itself, <coughs> not how Kubernetes manages a group of containers. Right. So right now, developers are left to themselves to make decisions about how they create a container. And the set of best practices is port best. And your average developer, um, you know, very frequently is is hacking on somebody else's code or application, or you know, and they have no idea what the actual code paths are, right? If you want to take an application and you want to reduce the tax surface of that application, right? You want to make sure that if somebody gets a zero day exploit and they can get in, to, they get in past the application, say they get you know shell access, right? You want to make sure they don't have access to anything past that. Well, if you bring all the rest of the operating system with it, you've got all of the shell languages, you've got Ruby, you've got Python, you've got, you know, just a, 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 a potpourri of different tools that you can then use as the attacker to escalate your privileges. If in the container, there's only what the application needs to run, only the libraries that it executes, only the things that happen during its normal uh, code execution, then if you breach into it somehow, if you can even get a shell, because it may not even have a shell in the container, um, but if you can, right, then you, it's very hard for you to get any further. And, but the tooling to allow you to do that easily as an unsophisticated developer who doesn't understand security, who doesn't understand about, I hate to say this, but probably a fair few of them don't even understand how shared libraries work. Um, and if, if, if you don't have the tooling, it makes, them easy, it makes it easy to do that. What a developer defaults to is like, well, I'm going to reduce the risk that this is going to break, so I'm going to shove every freaking thing that I might possibly need in there with. 
Right, but that sounds like it's a container packaging problem versus it's a container packaging bare metal problem. versus hyperliner problem. That's correct, and that's been my point from the beginning. I'm sorry if that wasn't clear, is, is that the container problem for me around security is that Docker made it easy to use, consume containers, and they made it so that by consuming containers in the way they gave it to you, you would do it the wrong way by default, because right. it's so easy. Yeah, that's one of the points I was saying is we have made our own service layer, so yeah. developers are never exposed to the Yeah, and they probably like that. Couldn't you just like provide base containers for people to use, like an artifactor? And in the CI pipeline, just provide you know a Jenkins library that is just a pipeline for a specific language. Then you can like easily control you know how diverse your apps get. You know if you do multi-stage Docker, you know you can specify the you know the build stage the unit test stage separately, but you it's only all a very small amount it's, of. It's all doable. Yeah. It's just not being done. By the end of developing, that's true. I mean, I, you know, so I was an advisor to Docker for a little over a year, and um, Docker's lead investor uh, was my lead investor in my startup. And um, I sat down with Solomon when it was dot .cloud, and they were about to close the doors before Docker took off. And, you know, with all due respect to Solomon, and he's a very smart guy, he's not a systems guy. And he didn't really get it. I mean, have you ever played with Union file systems? Like, once upon a time, I mean, it's not... I mean, it's just, there's some odd choices he made, many, many odd choices. And um, and so, I, you know, I don't really want to knock him that much because, hey, people are using a shit ton of containers. And I actually think containers are going to be great for us. And I think that hypervisors were a sideshow that was based off of having too many 32-bit single-core apps or single-threaded apps uh, in the land of 64-bit servers. And I think that when we'll look back in 10 years and we'll go, hypervisors, virtualization, what was that? And containers will be the de facto way. That's what I. That's what I really believe. Um, and um, you know, and, and just we're here. So I'm. I'm gonna be the guy in the forest who's saying, "Yell, yell, and follow me." And maybe some people will, 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 and some won't. But hopefully, over time, we'll get there. And, and also, just we're recording, um, and it will be posted on our website until the end of days. Great, I'm going to hear so, from HP. I just would like to, <laughs> I'm just saying, the less I have to do editing to take out your colorful language afterwards, the better. So, it was only, it was only one, Lisa. It was only one. I, I haven't yeah, worked okay. there in a really long time. I dropped the F-bomb during oh, the EMEA text on the internal Juniper sales training. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this is our user group, and I have a code of conduct that promise people I'll keep a plate, so I will edit that one out, but let's just... I said unbudged. Let's be on our best behavior. All right, just so saying, we, let's work for me later. We, we've covered several... We've covered... We, we've talked about um, beams make it easy, bare metal. So sounds like there's some agreement here that, that bare metal provisioning, if you can stomach it, if you can get, if you can get the tooling right, if you get the processes right, if you're not trying to bring the VM mindset into... Uh, into how you're configuring and <coughs> deploying containers. That's the better way to do it. Hey, Paul, does Siri use containers at Apple? Yeah. Is it run on metal or VMs? Last I heard, it was 80,000 oh, plus. Right, because it runs by 20 inch. <laughs> 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 okay. I already got it from a guy by the name of Josh. But, oh, that was last name. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, everybody's yeah. But if you are talking about eBay, talking about Apple and Google, then I, I, definitely, I mean, definitely I, they are running. The, they have the experience, they have the engineering team, so they can manage uh, the bare metal. Uh, but for the general, mm -hmm. like uh, FinTech, this type of enterprise, they probably still prefer to have the virtual machines. But another point I think, well, we start seeing people moving their critical applications into cloud. So if we, are, we believe this is a trend, and eventually most of the applications are running on the cloud, I think the tooling of bare metal or the virtual machine probably doesn't make much difference anymore. Uh, I mean, at some point, Amazon's not going to want to pay the 20 or 30% performance penalty if all the hypervisors yeah. are doing is hosting containers. Because that equates to 20, 30 percent profit. Yeah, but for the end uh, user, they don't care if it's running. I, I totally agree with that. 
Um, okay, so can, can we hang on? We'll, we'll get there probably soon. So we talked, a little, you, you touched briefly on firearms, um, and then we moved on. But as one of the things that was mentioned when we were doing this prep was the notion that uh, as security policies get abstracted away, um, how does it? How is that impacting firearms, containerized firearms? So, if you want to, I know Henrik had some ideas on this as well. Yeah, I mean, Henrik was spot on when he was talking about kind of abstracting away mm -hmm. sort of the, the firewall notions. Uh, June first, doing stuff around intent-based policies. I assume you guys are too, and that's just the notion of sort of getting away from ports and IP addresses and VLANs and network blocks and and really focusing on having a policy that's attached to an application or tiers of an application that falls around, goes with it as it scales up and down. Not rocket science, but you know, it, in, in, in many ways it's great because it takes a lot of the security from the security teams where it does not belong, uh -huh, um, to the application developers where it does belong, right? I mean, if we basically held application developers responsible for their own security and then gave them all the tools and the training so that they could do it uh, and held them accountable for any problems, just like Amazon does for operational stuff for Amazon.com, and then we would get a better, much better outcome, right? The idea that we're going to go to this special cadre of SWAT, you know, security guys who can solve all our security problems is, is just crazy. So the tuning has to get better. Well, we, we see, you know, a, a, a sort of a huge divide in, in, in that sort of space where um, enterprise customers are still sort of dividing security um, into, into traditional groups. So... Um, in many ways, the, the DevOps team will um, take responsibility for vulnerability scanning and keeping the registry clean, and, and there will be some, some gating mechanisms that will allow them to, to release or not. Um, but once a, a container or a cluster is in production, that still you know, traditionally falls onto the security and, and, and network people to keep this thing running and keep it safe, and we see image drift, and we see all sorts of, of crazy stuff that sort of creeps in over time, right? So it comes out clean and pristine, and then over time it sort of morphs into something, even though the word DevOps suggests it's one sort of big happy family, these, you know, you're essentially asking the fox to guard the chickens, right? The, the developers, you know, um, priority number one is to get features out as fast as possible, right? In, in so, um, you may skip certain, um, you know, protocols along the way. And, and once a, a, a container is in production, it takes on a life of its own, whether that life is five minutes or five days or, or half a year. And it's prone to, to the sort of the traditional attacks that the developer has no insight into. And so that's, you know, that, that's the whole premise. So, uh, yeah, also I think when people are talking about the shipping life, they're, mm -hmm. actually talking, they're actually talking about, you know, image scanning hardened the system, but think about image scanning, this is not very much different from the antivirus or the API solutions, right? So you only scan your image at the time you scan that image. Uh, when you run that image in the runtime, there are other ways uh, your containers can be compromised, and also their zero-day attacks. So, so that's why I think the CI/CD process definitely important, but not enough. I just think that's total bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just I'm, this is I'm I'm gonna rant. I, I just like I just I'm so sick. So I got out of the security industry because it just became snake oil. <laughs> I'm gonna find some new problem that I gotta sell you some new widget for, and it just escalation, escalation, escalation. And I feel like nobody wants to solve the security problems. And I'm gonna give you an example. The idea that these environments can diverge over time is accurate in the old world. There is no reason for them to diverge now. If you had a stripped down container that was 10 megabytes in size, it had only an application code in it. You could look for anomalies happening with that application at the code execution level, on the disk, in memory, in process space, and in processor execution. You can do all that relatively easily because you've scoped it down. Anybody remember Tripwire? 
Never running tripwire on a big ass disk drive and it taking days and days and days. Well, if you want to run on a container, a 10 meg container, right, you could run it every five minutes. Bing, 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 bing. And that's a very old school technology, right? So I believe that the, that the time has come for security vendors, including Juniper, to get off their arse and start building secure forensic analysis on the post haste because shoot it and replace it with another one automatically. Now, if I'm an attacker and I was trying to get into a thousand containers and every time I breached one, it disappeared on me within 10 seconds, I would not get very far. And I just really think that this attitude of like, you know, you've got to put kind of like static moats and gates that are semi-dynamic on top of it isn't the same as really addressing the root problem, which is how do I have security become much more dynamic and how do I have it more attached to the actual way that the application is, is created and run in production? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think we just look at the issue as a different aspect. Uh, I believe you're saying, okay, so we can build the baseline as a, you know, uh, before the deployment, but actually enforcement actually happens in the runtime. So yes. we are talking, if we are talking about the security at runtime, we're actually talking about how to enforce this baseline and do the de uh, non -de detection. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the things we've done is, is we have, um, created in a, in a partnership with, uh, with JFrog and, and, uh, and Artifactory, a sort of a feedback loop mechanism where when a container is compromised at runtime, it goes back and tags that container in Artifactory and notifies the developer. Isn't that a novelty, right? <laughs> well done. That's more <laughs> but but that is LLC. sort of, you know, that is in order to, to create some process and bridge that gap that, that you know, that Questions? Yes, I mean, we have. Yeah, I got a question. Thank you for the great information. Thank you for the great information. My question is uh, what is your opinion about uh, technologies like trusted execution environments, uh, Intel SGX, uh, Enclaves? Uh, how can those technologies help uh, address some of these issues, especially if you're taking a holistic approach like you're talking, you know, con container focused, uh, container centric, looking all the way? Uh, to the application? Um, that's a great question. Um, before I went to Juniper, I was thinking about doing a startup that would take what is a very secure platform and basically take this into the data center, right? This has TPM on it, it's got the enclave, you know, all the applications run in containers, sandboxes. And this is a very, very secure device. We know it's secure because the FBI has to ask for help in order to okay. it. Where the, nothing runs on the system unless you said it can run on the system. And once you're there, right, you can start to apply great things like machine learning to figure things out faster than the operations person would. You know, 10 of these containers suddenly had the same event occur. That should not happen. Isolate those things on the network and or shut them down so we can do forensic analysis on them. Don't even ask somebody. And it, you know, it's sad because all the technology is really there, and um, but we seem very resistant to deploying it. So, yeah, so, great so I have, um, you know, sort of a, a, a real example of, of how hard that is in in real life, right? So, we we implemented um, something called auto response rules, where you're setting up um, baselining and you're setting up sort of like anomaly rules. What should happen if we see X, Y, and Z? And, and if you're not careful, you know, we will quarantine the Nginx load balancer that sits in front of your entire application stack, and down it goes, right? And so I, I think, you know, the, the idea of, of shooting the containers down. How many like Nginx like, load balancers are there in front of your application stack? Well, for, for one service, there's typically one, right? Well, you've just proven so, the problem. You're treating your load balancer like a pet instead of cattle. There should be N or N plus two, and if you cordoned off one or two of them, that should right. be a problem. So I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the premise of, of shoot it down, and it will probably minimize the, the sort of the, the uh, encouragement of the attacker. I'm just saying in a, what we see is people are very conservative when it comes to um, moving into security automation. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think all, reasons, we would all right. agree that IT people are highly secure, highly conservative when it comes to automation, but the reality is, is that we're just not going to get there without it. And 
you know, you can you can do things like you can have the you could have a machine learning algorithm detect an anomaly uh, within a few seconds and then notify a security operator to validate it within a few minutes. I mean, there's there, it could be human it sure. could be ML assisted, right? Yep, so yeah, yeah, yeah. don't take my hyperbole and my extreme example as the only way of doing things, right? I mean, automation has its own dangers, but the danger. I mean, if you think that like machine learning and automation is not going to be applied to the attacker side. You're crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if we don't do it first and, and really think about how to make these systems more secure, then it's we're gonna we're gonna feel the brunt of it. Attackers can take advantage of. So still runtime security detect the process, detect the system call, you know, uh, still important. It's in the, the system system level security is important, but application level security is sometimes we, we, we are lacking, you know, of tools to John, a question in okay. or come. I would disagree with the last statement that more of the value of machine learning. For a security company, we detect a hundred times fewer attacks a week, which we feed back into our network. It's a question of just really detecting stuff and continuous monitoring. It's not point in time. If you go through a continuum and continue updates. Which, Humans can't even keep up with it anymore. Yeah, you can. I mean, it's totally impossible. Because we get, you know, a hundred gigabytes or terabytes of data for a time off. Uh, human beings can't do it. Yeah, and most of it's junk. And most of it, most of it is junk. But when you find your thing that you can push back, it's really, really valuable. Super valuable. It's incredibly valuable. Can you ask it? Let's see. I think you had your hand up first. There you go. And you want to talk about unikernels. So you all mentioned, you know, these kind of dynamic runtime scanning analysis tools. Um, you know, we our, our business model right now is we you know, give software, we package software, customers run it on general purpose machines, you know, VMs, bare metal, whatever. Um, we'd like to switch to where we deliver container images that they can't mess around with. And you know, a lot of customers run lots of different security scanning tools. So once we go to a, a container-based delivery model, they won't be able to put on all that junk and use those dynamic scanners. So you know, then it's kind of on us to choose you know, what we hope will work for a majority of our No, you just let them run it from the host side, because they can see into the containers from the host side. So like, and, they have the, and the tools will still work, you're saying? Or sure. The tools leave off okay. I mean, I, I don't know all the specific tools, but yeah. some, some percentage of them, some Large percentage will work probably so, without thank communication. You. Uh, this gentleman over here. Thank you. If we talked about profiling the content identity applications and come up with the baseline and yeah. try to enforce it runtime, yeah. but that leads into false positives. Now, how realistic it is to solve that problem using machine learning? Well, you you completed two things. I haven't talked about using machine learning to to, to deal with code path enforcement. Right? That's that's those are two slightly different things, right? And um, but could you be more clear about so what you mean by when you prepare um, a baseline? No? Yeah. The, then no, when during runtime when you want to enforce it, you will run into false positives. Like what? Give me an example of false positive you would run. Means uh, even though there is an attack, there is no attack. You may declare it as an attack. <coughs> you can't. It's not easy, you know, to come up with a, a good baseline. I, I think you're conflating the security anomaly versus the actual code path runtime. Yes. Which I think are two vastly separate things. Right. You're, Randy's uh, saying that we profile applications with actually hooks and calls that calls the kernel in its operational practices. We go through, look at the runtimes it's pulling to very heavily constrain what's available in the runtime. You're concerned over what happens in that runtime. The completely separate thing and not yes. something that Randy's directly covered right. and not what anyone's saying we do machine learning with. Let me give you a simple example. A very common type of exploit in the past is a buffer over overflow that gives you a shell access. So what you're doing is you, you're running over the memory that your application has access to in another part of memory space and you're able to execute a shell and get access to it. Right? Well, if you've baselined or you've profiled everything that your application does and you know that it can never access certain parts of memory and or it can never access the shell executable and run it, 
then the minute it does those things that it's not supposed to do, you send up a flag. Right? So what kind of tools do we have to profile them? People have, had code, people have had code path enforcement tools for a long time now, actually. There are things that actually look at every code path that your code can run or execute, and they profile it all, and they basically whitelist all that. And if your uh, uh, code ever tries to do anything else, um, it, um, you know, it'll, it'll throw it. I'm trying to remember, what was, the, what was the one that Simon Crosby went and did real recently? Uh, Bromium? Yeah, Bromium. Bromium? Yeah, Bromium. Yeah. But that, that stuff's been around for a long time, and it just gets even easier. If you're going to use, for example, if you use a tool that that runs your application uh, as if it's in production to find out all the shared libraries that it talks to, you're going to exercise all the code paths. Yeah, and data it that, looks good, but you know, doing that in, in, in reality and you know, getting that to production, you know, how realistic it is. People how have been doing that for a long time. With, uh, how come people are not come up with the tools so that you know, others can adopt it? If well, it's a, such it's a bulletproof solution. Well, I didn't say it was bulletproof. It's bulletproof for that one aspect, which is basically watching the code path execution of a specific application, right? I mean, if you, if, and, and, and let's back away from that specific solution because I, I was, I'm just throwing up examples, right? And, um, you know, Apple doesn't do that on iPhone, right? They just use sandboxing, right? So you're inside of your sandbox, your container. And you can't access any of the other resources on the device. You're sort of locked down from accessing them. So they don't have to monitor every code path that your code runs. And it's too onerous for them to do that anyway, because all those apps are coming through the App Store. They're getting the update all the time. They can't go execute them all. So they take an even simpler approach to it. But whatever it is, the point is, is the anomaly-based anomaly -based detection, where you have sort of a whitelist model and you know what is appropriate behavior, is, is much more effective because you're saying, this is the way the application works normally. If there's any deviation from this, then throw a flag, right? Whereas what we do now is we say, we have no idea how the application is going to behave. It could do anything. Let's just try to like put firewalls all the way around it and encrypt everything on disk and make sure the secrets are separated in the secret database. And like all of those pieces are sort of a kludge where if we actually did know what the application is going to do, we could say, this is what the application does. This is all it does. If it does anything else, stop it. But in microservices world, you know, you have a very defined thing, you know. Which makes it easier to actually do yeah, this. Yeah, But I, I don't come across you know, anybody you know, automating this. This is my point about the security industry being full of snake oil is because it's not in their interest to basically try to solve some of these problems because then it's going to be harder to sell you stuff. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's, uh, there's one other topic that we had come up with in the prep, and that was about unikernels. It used to come yeah. up every couple of years. We get to talk about unikernels again. Um, but if there's, I mean, if you can get past the idea that you're avoiding um, you know, a, a breach tends to equal a ring zero bad day. Don't steal system. my thunder, dude. <laughs> well, <laughs> we also got Mr. Mr. Unikernel in, in the audience, Ian. So, um, do you want to do you want to start? <laughs> I don't mean to start. I'll start. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> 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 these topics, and then you have the mic. Uh -huh. you go first. I guess so. I mean, um, there's nothing wrong with unikernels. They just don't belong in production. <laughs> <laughs> They're very useful for IoT devices. So let's talk about ring zero. Why, why is that such a problem? Uh, because you can run privilege, you can run code. At, and why, why is that a problem? Because then you can access anywhere in memory. Repeat like the question. Programs? Yeah. So, so if I have one program per process, per VM, can I access another process inside that VM even though it's consigned to only one process per VM? Um, Let's let's do this. Let's do this maybe a different way. You you buy that if you take a container and you actually strip it down, you reduce the attack surface dramatically, right? Except for your gigabytes of containers that exist, the shells and users and languages. If you did it properly, okay. right? As I as I laid out at the beginning, right? Sure. If, if you if you take the single application that's supposed to go in a container, much like a unikernel application, uh, and you strip it down, then you've only got you know some very small. You know, number of lines. You're speaking loudly. He's not. So you buy that. I've reduced the attack surface, right? Okay. It's, I mean, it's done right, right? Now, if I introduce a kernel into there, into that container, 
I've just now increased the attack surface because I've got the attack surface of the kernel itself, which in many cases, like the Linux kernel, is pretty significant compared to the size of a typical web application. Yes, right. Um, there's stuff in there that if it's not stripped out, you know, I could get access to. I might be able to basically uh, shoot over uh, pre-compiled kernel modules and load them up into the kernel itself. I have a lot more flexibility for what I can do. Inside a container that's been locked down, my options for accessing and loading kernel modules is basically zero. I, I would argue that's not the case because containers by definition have to reside inside Linux. Even the stuff that's residing on Windows sure. is actually inside of a tiny Linux container. Sure, but I'm running as an unprivileged user. It still has the concept of multiple processes, which I argue is the sure. which I argue is the main security problem out there. It's a concept that's forty years, fifty years outdated, uh, for the way that developers actually push software out to DMs nowadays. I mean, the, the, what we're really talking about is the Unix model is broke. Like we migrated a long time ago from Unix when we went to AWS. Like every every VM is every process is now a VM. All the users, that's IAM. You know, so that model's dead. Um, You're gonna have to be more clear what you mean. Probably like one of the worst course. security models out there, honestly. <laughs> well, I mean that I understand that that's your opinion. I think I've made yeah. a very good case for why that is actually a, a, a misunderstanding and a misuse of containers themselves. Right, and you can look at the fact that Google is one of the most secure infrastructures we've ever seen that's running containers on metal, not unikernels and not VMs, and, and that's a pretty good, that gives us a pretty good understanding that containers, if run properly, can actually be quite secure. But, but Randy, doesn't this come back to my original point, which is if you run a very homogeneous infrastructure where you can control the whole app stack, you can do it bare metal, very secure. If you like most enterprises run a very uh, diverse Yeah, but they're not taking those workloads and sticking them right. in containers, Henrik. Right. That's not what's happening. That's not where the growth is. The growth is on the new cloud native apps. That's what's going in containers. And God bless you, unikernels. <laughs> um, but th they're, they're not lit. Oracle Rack is not running any goddamn containers. Great. Don't look at me. All right. No, I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking at you as a timekeeper. <laughs> is it over yet? Can we go over? I, Are we, uh, I still, I still want to mix it up with yeah. with, with your friend because he's sure. clearly knowledgeable. I might yeah. learn and something. Would, he might smack me down. Against Google because just like uh, what four months ago, the guy posted screenshots of Org, which was God forbid not Docker running inside of Google, and of course that's all backed by VMs because they don't trust containers more than they can throw. Um, so I mean, it, it, containers are completely broken. I, I think that's the problem that you actually highlighted earlier was people were trying to use Containers are not a security abstraction, yeah. but they can be configured securely. VMs are not a security abstraction, and unikernels are not a security abstraction. And in fact, I would argue that for the most part, most things aren't security abstractions except for dedicated tools like firewalls, right? But I, here, here, here I'll, I'll, I'll show you what a firewall was. You probably aren't aware of this, but in 1992, when I deployed one of the first firewalls I ever did, there were no firewall products. So I had a router with ACLs, I had a bastion host that ran SOX, and then I had another router with ACLs. That was a firewall that's a demilitarized zone. That is the classic definition. So a firewall is a security function more than it's a security product. And it's a way for you to enforce network security in a certain kind of way. Now, you're making an argument somehow that unikernels are more secure. And I'm trying to make a more abstract argument, which is it's less about like whether I pick a particular technology, whether it's a couple of routers at the bashing host or a checkpoint firewall. I'm trying, oh, sorry, Juniper, SRX, SRX. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm trying to make the point that there are things that, that, that you use to sort of measure the security of the system and how you do the security architecture. Attack surface, attack vectors, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and, and when I look at something like a unikernel, like, I'm not saying it's terrible. It might be good for running a specific firewall in a container environment to provide network firewall services. Certainly better than running that as a VM. But it's, I, I would just argue that it's about how that thing is configured as much as it is about how a container is configured. Because I can tell you right now, I can build you a unikernel-based system that will be insecure as all hell and back. Have you actually been to one before? You know, just the stuff that comes with, uh, you know, 
an operating system like OS X for like the rump kernels and stuff for like you know, sure. just because I mean like the, the whole security model of EM kernels in general is that they're single process by design and so like as an attacker it's just no like, kernel like my goal is not to exploit a piece of software I could care less about what bug I'm trying to exploit I'm trying to get on your server yes so then I can like dump the database I can run some crypto jacking code you Whatever yeah, but you you, viol really you, you violated well. like one of the first principles of defense in depth when you're running your process code at ring zero. And, you, and you, what is that? Defense in depth. You have to have multiple but, layers. But what you want to run. Violating? You're violating the security gonna, principle like, called defense in depth. If I do that, am I going to hijack another I'm, process? I'm being very clear with my words. I said you're violating a principle, and I think that's extremely clear. I don't think you need to misconstrue what I said because it's not helping your argument. Okay. You're violating the principle. The argument. You don't understand the security principle of defense in depth. Do you know what defense in depth means? Well, I, I know that I've been to several security shows in the past year, and like half the early stage people are all computer security because computer security is such a shit show of, you know, why. <laughs> it, it almost makes the container um, market like. Like worse, you know, it's like Tesla got owned because they had Kubernetes open. All the different secrets. I'm not making any arguments for Tesla containers. got owned because they did not conform to best practices. Let's be clear about that. They had the control plane running on the public internet. If you fucking do that, you ask it for it. <laughs> That's also a violation of the defense in depth principle. So anyway, I think we should leave it. Um, wait, again, wait, when you're, you say, you're, let's you're, argue, you're my unicorn guy. <laughs> 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 All right, I tell, you, I tell you, let's let's do this. Let's do this. We're over time, and I know just respecting people's schedules, we've got uh, Lisa. If there's some protocols here, but what I propose we do is kind of let everybody get like another beer, get some drink, get some pizza, cannolis. We have cannolis. Cannolis. Mm. Do we have? Do we really have cannolis? Yeah. Um, a couple of. Uh, thing is there one is there okay we're a little bit over but we did allow a little bit of overage if there's one question that people have been dying to ask that the shy people have not been able to ask um, we can take one more question um, because I know what happens because I've done this for five years y'all are just gonna come storm the castle here and these three people will be pinned to the wall and it's probably the same question somebody else wants to ask too so I'm willing to take one more question and also, I just want to thank everybody for all the colorful language. Thank you, my friend. My video <laughs> job is now going to keep me up for many more hours than it was. But you know what? That's a risk you run between Happy you ending. and my Randy to your house. <laughs> yes. I have this reputation. <laughs> Love, you've earned this reputation. Um, so, I'll, anyone, one last question? Anyone? Anything? that? Okay. All right. And I'm trusting you that it's going to be a good one because this is the last one. All right, Arnold. Here you go. I'm going to do my best. So one of the things that I found in my career, and, and my career is network engineer, not necessarily you know, service or whatever, network engineer. So what I have found is that uh, devices that I despise absolutely, I call them firewalls, <laughs> the best value they provide is to prevent the develop developers from doing stupid things. Just flat out stupid. Like, uh, accessing your database directly from the web server or something like that instead sure. of using an API, right? Sure. And then when they open firewall requests, like I want to open a port, on, uh, I want to access a database on port, I don't know, it's 1522 or something in Oracle, right? It gives the systems people an opportunity to say, why? <coughs> that is probably the biggest value I've seen traditional security products provide is give the systems people, the architects, the opportunity to tell the developer you're an idiot. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then how would you, how would you address uh, I can't frame this problem any other way other than developer education. Like you mentioned that developer's primary job is to get features out of the door, and I absolutely agree with that. That's what's bringing revenue, right? This is what, where we make money. But then how do I make them slow down and say, you can't, like, you have to implement SSL in this connection. You can't just say, oh, build me a VPN tunnel, and I'll just do on encrypted text, whatever, right? It, it's, why don't, you figure, why don't you figure out how to speed up? In what sense? Um, you could use, for example, instead of a, a centralized network appliance, you could use a distributed host-based firewall that they don't have access to. You only have access to the containers. They could attempt to make a non-encrypted 
a connection to a database, you could intercept that in real time, realize it wasn't allowed. Instead of just blocking it, you could actually send them a notification, email or even an SMS to their phone and say, you're making an unencrypted connection uh, to a database, which is not something that we allow in production. Um, you need to basically fix your code. And by the way, it came from this specific application with this code release on this machine. And then you could take from doing that in production to doing it in the CI, CD, and dev release pipeline as far back as you can. Maybe not on their laptop, but certainly in the staging environments. And that would allow you to catch that stuff even before it went to production. And that's fair. And the argument they usually make is that you're slowing me down. Mm -hmm. they, 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 what they mean by that is that they want control. And so what you can do is you can create a situation where they can have control. What do they have control over? They have control over the code. If you tell them what they're doing wrong in the code, you show them where you're doing it wrong in the code, and you do it near real time, they have the opportunity to fix the code in real time and push a new code release. And in this world where we're trying to have rapid iterations, they shouldn't be able to complain about that. This is the same reason that public cloud kind of took off is because the disk doesn't work. I call the API, spin up another disk. Never doesn't work. I call the API, spin up another work, whatever, whatever it is. So if you uh, empower them but then spank them every time that they go to do something bad in real time and tell them what they did bad, they can change their behavior in real time. And this is part of what I mean. Like the whole static thing where you set up those network appliances and like, you know, and they have to file a fucking a freaking ticket. <laughs> ticket to like, you know, fix stuff. It's just, it's just, of course they're going to try to round around it. The best security is security that is easy to adopt and use. The minute you make security difficult, people will route around it and people are great at routing around things just like the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, 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 that, and that's fair. Um, but we still find unencrypted has to be part. Not unencrypted. <laughs> uh, uh, open I, access. I, I'm part. telling you, there are ways to solve these problems that are different than the traditional ways. We have just we have we have we have, we have held on to these things like they're like they're, like we love them. Like I, I like I love it when the developer has to come to me and beg to open up a port between the two VMs. Like, oh, I hate it. Yeah, I despise it. Well, then you should be incentivized to fix it. Priesthood. And, and the second problem is that I can't scale it. That's right. There's not a firewall I can buy. I, I have a limit. Let's say I have a limited supply of money. There's no firewall at my scale available yep. to me to buy. Yep. And that'll always be true as long as you're scaling up and says scale now. <laughs> All right. You, you did. You said best for last. You, you brought it. Thank you for the, the question. And I, I see this fear here. And now I'm understanding. The language gets. Um... Sorry. <laughs> no worries. I'm sorry. This is something I've been dying to do all night. Oh yeah. Okay. That's real. All right. Uh, I was, I've been seeing Nelly in my head all night long. It's um. Which one? Death metal version, of course. <laughs> Getting hot in here. What do you mean? Which one? What Nelly song was in your head? Country grammar. Country grammar, because the fire reminded you of that. It is hot in here. Um, you guys brought it. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to network for another 13 minutes. Um, so you can storm the castle. But um, but I'm glad we got that last question in there. That was a good one. There is more pizza, I see. Um, and um, thank you for whoever brought me the wine the, and the gluten-free pizza, because you know I can't do beer and pizza. So oh, thank you so much. The guy from Tennessee. Wow, awesome. So um, thank you all for coming, and we will see you on November 1st. That was Kriti, by the way, that I was talking to outside, so Oracle was in the house. She was just shy. Um, so we'll see you November 1st in Redwood Shores, and um, we'll all be mingling for another 15 minutes. So thank you all. Big hand for Juniper, for hosting. I have never seen a fire for a fireside chat quite like this one. So you guys really took it extremely seriously. So thank you for the fire. Thank you for whoever did that. Thank you to Neo Vector. Thank you, Henrik and Greg. Um, and thank you all for coming to be awesome members of this community. I'll see you guys on the first. Yeah. All right.